Hi, welcome back. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, we need you to fill our minds with your holy words. Help us understand your truths as we dive deep into seeking your heart. In your name, holy Lord Jesus, amen. Well, isn't it remarkable as we think about God's immeasurable love to his people through his word? I love studying the book of Ruth, and at the top of the list, I love its unpredictability. The moment you think you've got it figured out, it throws you for a loop. Ruth, the book, it surprises and disarms our assumptions about how God works and how God communicates through scripture. The book of Ruth, it begins in a pretty depressing way. Virtually everyone dies. Death and weeping and hopelessness and disobedience and everything that can go wrong does. It's a lot like watching a commercial for a new medication and at the last five seconds they list the side effects. Nausea and vomiting and difficulty breathing and death. What? This chapter reads like a list of bad side effects. But it's only part of the story. By the end of the book of Ruth, you will see God bring this all together because God is in the business of renewal and redemption and reconciliation. And Ruth tells in story form the deep truth of Romans 8:28. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. That does not mean that everything in life is going to be perfect. And we don't believe a Lego gospel. Everything is not always awesome. But this does mean because you believe in the God of hope and the God of recon reconciliation that even the broken, messed up parts of your life will be someday healed and restored because of sa our Savior Jesus Christ. And that's redemption. And that's what the book of Ruth is about, redemption. God making all things new. Well, Ruth is a story of two women and God, the redeemer of the world. And it showcases God's redemption through Jesus Christ, even though it's 1,000 years before Christ. So let me give you a breakdown of the four chapters of Ruth. Tonight we're going to just look at chapter 1. The story of Ruth showcases God's plan of redemption. In chapter one, we're going to see God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty. Chapter two will be God's favor, chapter three, Christ's love, and chapter four, Christ's eternity. So open your Bible to Ruth chapter one and grab a pen. Well, Ruth 1.1 1, 1 starts out in the days when the judges ruled. Well, this not only gives us the historical time frame, but also the political landscape. The days of the judges is 1200 to 1000 BC. So let's step back and get the 40,000 foot view of Bible history. In Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and the first husband and wife, Adam and Eve, and they became parents of the world and their lineage is linked then from Adam to Noah and then to a man named Abraham born about 2000 BC. Now in Genesis 12, God gave Abraham this blessed challenge and he said, leave your country and your people and go where I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and God, I will bless you. God is saying this, God will make your name great and all people on the earth will be blessed because of you. That is God's promise to Abraham. And though Abraham never saw this vast blessing about 500 years later, 1500 BC, there were over 2 million of Abraham's offsprings and they're called the Israelites. And then God raised up a faithful, obedient prophet named Moses to lead God's people, to obey God through the wilderness and get them to the border of the promised land. And Moses wrote about all the amazing things God did for the Israelites in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in about 1400 BC, just before Moses died, he commissioned another faithful, God-exalting prophet and leader named Joshua to succeed Moses in leading the people. And Joshua carefully recorded all this in a self-titled book, actually it was titled by others, 
but it's called Joshua. After the book of Joshua comes the book of Judges. And Judges chapter 2 explains the dreadful life the Israelites chose when they let all kinds of little g gods take the place of the one true God of the universe. When they replaced worship of God with worship of anything else. In Judges chapter 2, verse 7, it says that people served the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and the elders who outlived him and they had seen all the great things the Lord did for Israel. But after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not know the Lord or what God did for Israel. And so the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they forsook the Lord who had brought them out of Egypt. And they worshipped various gods of the people around them. You might want to go back to the Joshua lessons and see how God reminded them. That aroused the Lord's anger. And in the Lord's anger against Israel, the Lord gave Israel into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around. And whenever Israel went out to fight the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had told them it would be. And the Israelites were in great distress. In chapter, chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they prostituted themselves to the other gods and worshipped them. And they quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who were obedient to the Lord's command. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, God saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt, following other gods and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. The book of Judges is one of the darkest, wicked, rebellious periods in all of Israel's history. And so let me hit the pause button so we get a sense of what's happening in the world, in world history at this time. It's a time of tremendous cultural change. The Bronze Age has just come to a close. The Chao Dynasty in China was about to begin a 500 year reign. The Egyptian empire is on the brink of collapse. The Mayans are rising in power. And Israel was a colony of the Persian Empire. That's the place we find ourselves at this time. And so there were these global shifts in power. And what I love is God doesn't focus on any of that. Instead, he zooms in from the God of the universe to tell a simple story of a woman on a tiny spot of the globe. You see, God cares about running the universe, but he cares about your story, and he cares about my story, and he cares about the ordinary. God is with us in the mountaintops, and God is with us in the valleys of this life. He knows every breath. We can become junkies for the experiential, but our God is with you in day-to-day -day life. When you're stuck in traffic and you're washing dishes and you're driving your kids to school and when you're standing in line at Costco, and he's here with you as you listen. So Ruth showcases the God of the ordinary. Ordinary people trusting an extraordinary God. The people of Israel were surrounded by pagans and God chose the Israelites as a witness to reveal God to these pagan nations and reveal his perfect love. But instead, tragically, they became like the pagans. The Israelites ignored God and chose their own way and embraced sexual and social temptations. And that sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? The choices of the Israelites must cause us to consider our choices. As Christians, God chose and redeemed us to showcase Jesus Christ, our Savior, to the world, to the world that you and I live in. And knowing all God has done for you, how are you responding to him? And does your life reflect the holiness of God? And how have you experienced God's faithfulness? Your story serves as a daily reminder to help you genuinely worship the one good giver. 
Okay, so now back to Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Often in the Bible, famine equals judgment. So the book of Ruth describes a time when the Israelites, God's created and chosen people, were choosing wickedness over God. And God, in his love, uses judgment to wake up his wandering people and bring them home. His people refuse to obey him, so God refuses to feed them. Now today we don't have famines so much in the United States, but we definitely have poverty and recessions and joblessness. And yet we must recognize our daily bread does not come from the grocery store, it comes from God. Our daily bread comes from God, and God has the sovereign right to take away what he gives. So back to Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live in the country of Moab. All right, so now it's these kind of things that make us as Bible students and lovers of God delight in the beautiful surprisingness of our glorious God. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It literally means the house of bread. And throughout Ruth, you will see perfectly positioned ironies, which make this not just a love story, but a God story. A story revealing the wonder and the character of an all-knowing, all-perfect, surprisingly intimate God. And the first irony is, in the house of bread, People are starving to death. And this father is faced with a tough decision. Do I keep my family in Bethlehem to supposedly die? Or do I move 40 or so miles away to Moab, a pagan city? Don't miss this. It's like in your city, you're starving, but the county next door has plenty of food. And clearly, this is God's discipline, designed in love to wake up God's people. That's just 40 miles away, there's plenty of food. And it should have woken up Elimelech and Naomi. It should have made them think, before I solve this problem by uprooting my family, is there a spiritual problem I need to uproot and hold before God? But they don't, do they? They look at economics, they look at upward morbidity, they look at opportunity, and they say, off to Moab. And to do so, they had to hike through a desolate Jericho Pass and through the Judean wilderness near the Dead Sea to go across the Jordan River and into the land of Moab. And the text wants us to be absolutely clear. This is a definite departure from the promised land of Israel that they had worked so hard to be in. It was choosing to return to the wilderness from which God had delivered Israel hundreds of years before. And these were clearly steps in the wrong direction for a family of God. Moab is no place for God's people to live. They didn't worship the true God. Their culture had a reputation for perversion and human sacrifice. But out of fear or out of an unwillingness to lead his family to trust and obey God, Elimelech takes his wife and his sons and moves them away from their family and friends, moves them away from church, and moves them away from the strengthening fellowship to delight in God and help them see God. And so I wonder for you, what place of painful discipline are you in right now? And are you allowing God to root deep sin out of you? Or are you trying to get out of town to avoid God's discipline? It's always good for us to examine our painful places and hold them up before God. Places we don't understand, places we are confused, places we don't see the way out. And ask God to teach us and correct us through it. And that's called sanctification. It's a big word, but it's practical, progressing in spiritual holiness. A mind that thinks more like a God. And God cuts off things in our life that strangle our spiritual growth. And this allows God to mold us into something beautiful.
We've had the privilege to observe glass blowing artists and the lump of hard glass goes into a ridiculously hot fire to become moldable. And then the artist uses shaping tools to create beautiful art. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't quite turn out like the artisan had in mind and so he knocks off part of it back into the fiery oven. God is this great artisan of creation. He uniquely designed us, but sometimes we add things to our life that make us look ugly. It's sin and pride and bitterness and unforgiveness and trusting in things over trusting in God that is idolatry. And so into the fire of life we go so these things can be removed and our lives can be reshaped and purified. God's loving discipline is designed to make his children run back into his open arms. And running away from God never, ever sends you in the right direction. Avoiding the refining fires of life will never mold you into the beautiful creation God intended. Now, let me be clear. There are many biblical accounts that God gives a clear command for a follower of God to give up everything, to 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 minister into spiritually void places. And God mightily uses missionaries in 2000 BC and today to obediently, sacrificially go to the Moabs of the world. But that's not this situation. So if you're praying through a call to the mission field, this is not the context nor the intent of this text. But stick around because God will speak to you as we study his scripture, I have no doubt. Well, the story continues. In verse two, the man's name was Elimelech, which means my God is king. Irony number two, he doesn't act like he believes this, does he? Instead, Elimelech says, God isn't king, I am. I run my life. And his wife's name is Naomi, which means pleasant or sweet. And the names of his sons are Malon, which means sick, and Kilion, which means dying. <laughs> Naming your kids wasn't a matter of finding popular baby names in BC 1200. Names had deep prophetic or historical significance. And off they go to live in Moab. Have you noticed how the stress of life often leads us to foolish decisions. Just because times are tough, we can't make decisions based on comfort, money, income, or even what makes sense. Elimelech is a tragic example of a man who doesn't count the spiritual cost of moving his family. He doesn't consider that when a parent makes decisions for his family, he's affecting their future. When you decide where to take a job, you are also deciding who and your family will worship with, where and if you will attend church, who and what influences your children, and what direction their life will take. Elimelech left behind all their friends who loved God, and he took them to a place where his children would almost certainly marry unbelievers. He simply counted the financial cost without counting the spiritual cost. In verse 3, now Elimelech died. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why did Elimelech move to Moab? So that he wouldn't die. And what did Elimelech do the first thing he got to Moab? <laughs> well, he died. <laughs> we need to learn we are not the king of our life. God is. And we can make all the great plans we want, but the outcome is always in God's hands, not ours. Our life is held by our king. And why did he die? Well, scripture doesn't say, does it? And, and it's tragic. I don't mean to laugh at it. We, we find this in our lives too, don't we? Devastating things happen. And, and Naomi is left behind. And, and we cry out in devastation, why, God, why did you take my husband? Why did you take my child? But there's silence and God doesn't answer. And God lets the secret things belong to the Lord. We see only in part, and so in other words, God has shared everything we need to know. And we may or may not know everything we want to know. 
but we have to live by faith and we have to trust God. So Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. And in this is culture, her comfort was her sons would care for her in her old age. In verse 4, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. But verse 5, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So the big plan to save their lives fell apart. And this quickly turns from a depressing story to a tragedy. Burying a child must be one of the most painful life experiences. Two weddings, three funerals, and Naomi is alone in a strange country. Alone and broke with no one around her to point her to God. Absolute devastation, desolation, and desperation. So take any pain you've ever felt and multiply it and you have Naomi. So how in the world is Naomi going to respond? Well, in verse 6, when Naomi heard in Moab the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? The house of bread, the house of God has Food for the people so she packs up to go home and after many years the famine in Bethlehem is over the Lord has come to the house of bread and blessed his people with bread just like we saw the up and down cycle of the judges and Naomi even in her deepest despair reaches for God and when she does everything changes Perhaps you've experienced this. Your life spins out of control. You're discouraged and alone and hopeless, but something or someone reminds you to turn and take a step toward God. One God-guided step and your story changes. And this is the sovereignty and the goodness of God. God works through history and scripture and our lives, and God is continually at work in the everyday details of normal people. And for followers of Christ, God orchestrates every breath we take, every move we make. And God is both sovereign and good. And when the Bible says God is sovereign, that means God is the highest authority. And he rules all creation. And he is all powerful. And he is involved with everything. And God is perfectly good. And God is loving and patient and merciful and compassionate and kind in every way God is good. So these twin truths of God, his sovereignty and his goodness are entwined all the time. And sometimes it is very hard to understand, isn't it? Perhaps you've lost a family member due to drunk driving or you've been sexually assaulted or you've been bullied. Or you've lost your your husband, and you might ask if God is sovereign, doesn't that mean that everything that happens is in God's will? Well, in some of these cases, the answer is no, because sin enters in, and no sin or evil is ever God's will. Sin enrages God. God weeps and grieves and mourns when he sees sin and justice and rebellion of his children. God is sovereign. And God is good. And this means even though God allows man's evil, he takes that evil and turns it around and uses it for good. Romans 8, 28 says, God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. God doesn't waste your tears. He doesn't waste your suffering. He doesn't waste your hardship or your loneliness. He causes everything good and everything tragic to work together for good because God is not just soft. God is indescribably good. And so in Ruth, God takes the most devastating situation, a lady who's buried her husband and her sons and has nothing left. And the author wants us to know the only one who fixes it all is the Lord. God's sovereignty and goodness forever hold our story. God unravels the mess we make step by step. And so into verse 7, with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. 
They say, we are going where God is, where God's people are, and where God is blessing them. And that always sounds like a good place to, to go, a journey to take. And here's the funny thing to note, about 53% of the book of Ruth is dialogue, probably because the two main people in the book are women, and we love conversation, don't we? So before they get too far down the road, Naomi stops and she says to her daughters-in-law in verse 8, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, and may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. And go back to your mother's home. She says, I've got nothing to give you but this prayer in the God I believe in. May the God show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. There are nine prayers in the book of Ruth and every single prayer is answered by the end of the four chapters of Ruth. And you might wonder, if God is sovereign and God is good, why pray? Well, the answer is you pray because God is sovereign and because he is good. He wants to help because he is good. And he can help because he is sovereign. In verse 10, the ladies are weeping and they say, we will go back to you and your people. But Naomi says to them, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home because I'm too old to have more children. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, would you wait and remain unmarried to them. No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. That is hard to understand, isn't it? But what we see in this expression of faith is Naomi's absolute declaration. The Lord is sovereign. She is not denying God. She is not denying God's sovereignty. She is turning her face to go back to this God. In her suffering, she could have said God could have stopped the famine and could have stopped the move and could have stopped her husband and children from dying. And how do you identify with Naomi? In your painful situation, have you said, God, you could have done something, but you didn't? And the problem may not have come from God, but in this, we are just call to trust God and to cry out to God and, and, and ask him to show us how he'll bring good through it. God uses everything to sanctify you and me and to make us more holy and to make us more like Christ and to make us love God more wholeheartedly and to obey him more completely. And so for you and me, when we arrive at places where life is unbelievably hard, God invites us to stop and ask, God, how are you using this to sanctify me? Of course, we can still pray for God to change it. We can cry out to God with our, our hopelessness. So you can ask him to remove our suffering. We can plead with him for a miracle. And all of that is scriptural, but don't waste the suffering. God, until you decide to change the situation, how are you using this to sanctify me? Will you cling to this truth? For a child of God, there is no suffering and no affliction and no shedding of tears. And there is nothing bad that happens to us that is without purpose or without value as defined by God. Nothing is wasted in our journey toward becoming Christ-like. Believing this truth is essential because it changes our view of suffering, especially long-suffering. Instead of retreat, we run to God. Instead of hardening our hearts toward God, our hearts are made more like God's heart. In verse 14, at this, they wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Orpah does the expected, but Ruth does the extraordinary. In the last half of, of 14, it says, 
next. She says, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And then Ruth speaks for the very first time in this story. And it's some of the most endearing words in the Bible. My husband and I love these verses so much that during our wedding vows 23 years ago, after we said our vows, we squeezed each other's hands and we said, and starting in verse 16, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. It's such a loving commitment of honor, isn't it? And Naomi, she looks at her empty life and she says, I've got nothing. And Ruth looks at Naomi's God and says, you have everything. The Lord. Whenever you see the Lord like this in all caps, it is God's proper name. It is Yahweh. Yahweh. And at some point during her time in this family, the Moabite pagan Ruth began to understand the one true God, Yahweh. It was a pretty bold statement because Moabites were heathens. They were the enemy. And, and Moabite Ruth turns toward Israel alongside her mother-in-law, and a foreign country with no husband and no home and no friends and no family and no job, but with a God who was big enough for all of Ruth's emptiness. In verse 18, then, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women explained, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Well, the town didn't seem to recognize Naomi and her bitterness compounded her grief and made her unrecognizable to her friends and her family. In verse 21, she says, I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She left pleasant and sweet and returned home bitter. And she chose her name to declare her view of reality in that moment. God has ruined my life. And she chose bitterness. Let's be honest, no matter how much you love God and how many great things God has done in your life, sometimes we just aren't happy with the hand God deals us. Maybe God didn't answer your prayer or heal your, heal your child or give you a job or keep your home from defaulting or restore your marriage or save your husband's life. Or maybe you aren't bitter at God, but you're bitter at his people or at his church. Bitterness is a noose that suffocates the life out of you. And yet bitterness is your choice alone. It's not a fruit of the Spirit. It is not an attribute of God. You choose to hang yourself in bitterness. Naomi and Ruth had both gone through emotional and spiritual dryness and poverty and death of moving and loneliness. And though they face the same things, their responses differ significantly. So how have you allowed life to make you bitter or better? And as we see, bitterness blinds Naomi from the truth. Naomi fueled her bitterness about life and God because she was stuck on the past and blamed God. But the truth is, God Almighty has not brought misfortune on her. Instead, God, who created and holds Naomi, is on the move, bringing Naomi into a new beginning. Despite bad choices, God is always holding out a new beginning authored by him for you, his child. So verse 22, Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess and her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. New beginnings are on the horizon. This is the same Bethlehem where Jesus, the son of God, the Messiah, will be born in about a thousand years from this time in Ruth. And they return 
at the beginning of the barley harvest. The famine is over, harvest is sprouting, hope is growing, and God's blessing is blooming. A new season in Israel, a new season in the life of Naomi and Ruth. Are you in need of a new season? Now here is what this chapter in, in Ruth's story teaches us to do. Run to God and run to God's people. Run to God, run to God's people. Satan would have you view your life as hopeless, but God says your hope is secure. Your hope is found in Christ and your hope is fueled by God's people. So when you trust in Jesus as the Redeemer who died to redeem your life forever, God promises an unbelievable eternity for you. So what have you been or what have you gone through in life? Whatever it is, it doesn't have to define who you are. Your bitter past is erased today by Christ's blood. Jesus Christ shed his blood for you on the cross. So run to God and believe his promise of Jesus Christ, God's son sent to the world to save you, to redeem you. And how might you do this? How might you take one step toward God and one step back toward his people if you have isolated yourself? Maybe it's committing yourself to daily time with God or reading his holy words, or maybe it's turning off the talk radio during your commute and talking to God. And maybe it's stepping toward God's people by getting into a small group or finding a mentor, finding a prayer partner, saying yes to a ministry to serve others, returning back to church. So in all this, here is what I hope you take. Prayerfully step toward God and toward his people and wait on God's timing for the harvest to come. Prayerfully step toward God and toward his people and wait on God's timing for the harvest to come. Please pray with me. Our holy Lord God, how grateful we are that in our seasons of dryness, we are absolutely assured we are not alone, that you in your sovereign ways are using every second of our life to cut off what is unholy and refine us so we look and think more like our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We thank you for drawing us into your holiness and we ask that in these seasons we run to you and we run to your people to be in community with you, in relationship with you. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is what you died for our great Redeemer, in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me.